Hello there and a warm welcome to Joe News today. Coming up, three persons dead and three others injured and treated after an accident at the jabbing oil mills. We have the latest. Also, University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAC, meets with government over threatened strike action following what they say is government's failure to reach an agreement with them. And needed respite coming in for poultry farmers as a Greek minister reveals there's a memo currently before cabinet to adequately compensate farmers who lost birds to bird flu. We have details. Also, residents of Akode in the eastern region blame increasing cases of crime in the area on poor mobile telephone network connection to the community. We have business, sports, world news and show business all coming up in this package. Stay with us. Our Minister for National Security, Ken Dapa, is calling on civil society organizations to hold government institutions, especially his ministry, to account for their actions. Speaking at a workshop with CSOs on the National Security Strategy document, he explained government can work effectively if the CSOs play their parts. It is also recognized that these accountability institutions set up by the constitution, set up by the laws, which we refer to as the horizontal accountability institutions, most of them basically lack what it takes to hold the government to account, and that is independence. If you want to hold the government to account, what you really need is independent. Which is why my wife cannot audit me, because she hasn't got that independence. If she writes a bad report, it will reflect in the, in the, in the top money. Mm -hmm. So she, of course, will naturally advise herself. So this is also a challenge, even in the advanced countries. And what has been the solution? The solution has been to find other accountability institutions that will not have that problem of lack of pure independence. And in these countries, they rely on the media. But much more than that, they rely on civil society. Because civil society by definition, are normally uh, independent because civil society, by definition, normally have people who are really experts in the areas that they talk about. So, colleagues, that is how important civil society is going forward. If governance is going to be good, it will depend upon the extent to which civil society will play that role of holding governments to account. The National Security Strategy document, which was launched by the President in June this year, was meant to ensure effectiveness of the security and intelligence sector by revamping current systems and structures. A security analyst Adam Bona in an interview with Joy News explained the policy document does not explicitly have a plan for the gathering of data of unregistered security arms. He believes if the ministry is furnished with that data of unregistered small arms in the country, it will be able to track down users and deal with crime. In terms of the policy document, I think one area has to do with uh, baseline survey. You realize about nine, out, nine and a half out of ten violent crimes that are going on in this country are by the use of illicit firearm. So the policy document, even though a very good document, uh, I think we need to relook really at the issue of small arms and light weapons. As we speak, we don't have the most current uh, statistics or you know uh, data with regards to how many firearms are in the hands of uh, people that are not registered that are not known and once we don't know that it becomes difficult to deal with violent crimes so I want to see a situation where uh, probably a survey is conducted to know what is the 
the size of the challenge we are dealing with. If you want to build a house, you don't, you just don't get up and build a house, isn't it? You want to know uh, possibly the size of your family before you build a house. So, uh, and then the second thing has to do with funding source for the strategy. If you come up with a strategy that doesn't, that doesn't have a funding source, then there's a challenge. Even though it's a very good strategy, I want to see how do we finance the strategy. That has not been raised. And then also, I think we have a big challenge when it comes to state security officers. Some of them brutalizing citizens and citizens don't know where to go to. Because if a police officer was to beat you, you still go to the police station to report. What are the probability that you would get a fair hearing from the police? We don't know. Executive Director of Star Ghana, Ibrahim Tanko Amidu, however, says the national security strategy provides an avenue for CSOs to hold government to account. Over the years, civil society organizations have been involved in you know, peace, security and development at various levels, at the community levels, at the district levels, etc. But these have been isolated instances. So CSOE is working in Bole, CSOB is working in maybe Alavanyu, you know. There is no overarching framework that enables us to coordinate and collaborate. And so we see the strategy as a framework that promotes the collaboration, that promotes the working together, that enables us to avoid duplication. The third issue is the fact that there needs to be a way of holding government accountable. As the minister said, government is responsible for the delivery of public goods and services, for creating the environment to enable us to enjoy our rights. But where are we going to, where is the document that says that this is what government would do, A, B, C, D, E, F, in order to promote that enabling environment? And we think that the national security strategy provides the tool that we can use to hold government accountable. Now, the minority in Parliament has criticised the ongoing nationwide SIM re-registration by the Ministry of Communications and Digitization, describing the use of the Ghana card as discriminatory and unlawful. Addressing a press conference Tuesday, ranking member on Parliament's Communication Committee, Sam Nate George, urged the Ministry to withdraw threats to deactivate unregistered SIM cards by March 2022. The minority is therefore calling for an immediate revision of the process to make it easy and accessible to all Ghanaians. Pa Kwesi Shandov's report read to you. On Friday, October 1st, 2021, the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization began a nationwide SIMI registration to sanitize the digital ecosystem and minimize the rate of fraud-related activities involving the use of SIM cards. In this exercise, SIM card users across the country have to link it to their Ghana card. Now, the minority in parliament, however, believes insisting on the Ghana card as the only national ID for the exercise is discriminatory. Addressing the media ranking member on parliament's communications committee, Sam Nati George, described it as an affront to Allied 2111 and other relevant legislation governing SIM registration in Ghana. We strongly oppose any abuse of policy to unnecessarily inconvenience the citizens of this country. We find it most inappropriate that the policy directive is issuing a fiat of deactivating SIM cards that are not linked to a Ghana card within the next six months. We find this most unacceptable. This, we believe, is a retrospective application of legislation and a tunnel vision approach to sanitizing the industry. And why we say this is a retrospective approach to legislation is, do not forget that Ghanaians registered, most, almost every Ghanaian today holds a card that was registered in 2011, or since 2011, and they were registered in accordance with law. So if you are now applying LI 2111 retrospectively to affect those people, we believe that that is not the, the, the dictate of the law in our country. Member of Parliament for Sagnirigu constituency Alhaji ABA Fasini also decried the process and urged the Communications Ministry to revise its decision. In his view, the use of the Ghana card will needlessly inconvenience a lot of Ghanaians, especially those in rural areas. There are no offices of the, 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 the National Identification Authority 
in districts, even these are districts, so for them to be able to uh, 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 afford Ghanaians the opportunity to register. So these are districts. What about even the, the rural areas, which are the overwhelming majority of settlements in our, our country today? So you see clearly that the infrastructure in the districts and in the rural areas to register our people for this Ghana card is simply not there. Member of Parliament for the Bumprungu constituency, Ahmed Bandim, also lamented that over the past few years, the National Identification Authority has been consistently insensitive to Ghanaians in the implementation of its policies. The voter ID card is legitimate if it is legitimate enough to be used to elect a president and a member of parliament, of course it should be legitimate to be used for a registration of a SIM card in the country. I come from a rural uh, uh, constituency, in the Bumkuru constituency. We have villages, majority of whom don't have the NIA card, and now we are being told that they should be charged 200 Ghana cities before they can obtain the card. We think it's outrageous. We think that the government has a motive. And NCA, I believe, should be concentrating on improving quality of service in the rural areas and even in the cities than interested in registering SIM cards. The minority is therefore urging the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization to redraw the threat of deactivation of valid SIM cards by March 2022. It also called for the scrapping of the fiscal visit to an agent of a service provider for authentication of registration documents. So we offer the following four solutions to make the ongoing process more holistic and more effective in fighting SIM-based digital crime. One, the immediate withdrawal of the threat of deactivation of valid SIM cards by March 2022 by the Minister for Communications and Digitalization. Two, the scrapping of the physical visits to an agent of a service provider for authentication of the registration document. And I'll come back to explain this particular point. To make the process more convenient, the minority called for an integrated referencing of database of the passport office, DVLA, NIA and SNIT by the National Identification Authority. Lastly, the minority argued that passports, driver's license and voter's ID cards should be incorporated into the process to enhance mass participation by all Ghanaians. Parkwisi Shandov's report for Joe News. Still on the same re-registration exercise, there's been lots of public outcry since the announcement by government to start the re-registration. Lava Firm's news team took to the streets of Kumase to find out how telecom consumers are responding to the exercise. Frimpong is a phone repair at Tech Junction in Kumase. He believes the same registration exercise would help fight cyber fraud, although it may affect his business for the time being. It's going to help us prevent a lot of uh, fraudulent acts, which are, uh, how do you call it, this scammers and other people are doing are you getting it so when you register your sim i think the, uh, the database will capture you and any transaction you make would would, uh, would we will know who is responsible for the transactions you are making, making. some telecommunication subscribers indicate the exercise is only a waste of time and a means to embezzle state funds akusia menu is a trader at tech junction kumasi she explains the exercise will be of no benefit to her. Some cyber security analysts have raised concerns regarding this new policy. They say the new policy is not an effective approach to solving the increasing cases of cyber fraud in the country. Samuel Kwame Adomako is senior systems analyst of Narrowlight International. The initiative is a very good thing because yes, cyber crime has been on the increase for uh, decades now. Now, the implementation the government wants to do with the new SIM registration uh, with NCA, it's not something that is bad, but the approach would definitely lead us back to where we are currently. If you are to tell me 10 people can be registered with one Ghana card identification number 
Then it tells me if mistakenly my Ghana card falls in the wrong person's hand, that person can use my Ghana card identification to do a registration for his or her SIM. And that debunks the implementation method of we being able to stop the cyber crime rate. Because if this continues, it's just as what we have now, or the current operations we already have in the country. I believe if the government really wants to stop the cyber crime rate increase, the best thing they could do is to help the criminal investigation department of the Ghana Police Service to access information on these corporates in the act of cyber crime so that their locations or their various locations can be given to the criminal investigation department. And I believe this is going to reduce the rate of cyber crime. Or even if the government still wants to insist on using the new registration as a policy to stop this, one thing they could also do is either we line up so that officials would also identify that the person in front is the one who has that same Ghana card in possession. Emmanuel Bright Kuku's report for Joy News. Now, three workers of the Jabbing Oil Mills Limited have been confirmed dead in what the company describes as a mechanical failure on their boilers. Three others who sustained injuries have been treated and discharged. My colleague Erastus Asari Donko joins us live with more. Erastus, how did this happen? So, like the company put it, uh, as a mechanical failure, we are not uh, briefed as to what exactly happened because they say they themselves, they do not understand. But from a layman's point of view, um, what they are referring to as a mechanical failure is um, how an event, or let me say an opening, occurred on one of their boilers where steam, hot steam, was unleashed on these workers, leading to the death of three of them and the other three who sustained injuries, uh, they have been treated and discharged. This happened yesterday around 9 uh, in the evening. That is what we know for now. Erastus, is this something that a company has recorded in the past? No, uh, I'm told that they've operated for 40 years now without any blemish. Uh, no such incident has occurred. And that is what the uh, supply chain manager, Nana, as Rebo is saying, that it baffles they themselves and their technical people. And until uh, the experts uh, finish their investigation, uh, they wouldn't understand why uh, uh, the, the, the boiler uh, leaked in such a manner. Has this brought operations of the company to a halt? Exactly. Uh, they suspended operations as we speak. Even the workers, as you can see on their faces, they are traumatized and um, the company is trying to seek support, uh, uh, care for them uh, before uh, when investigations are completed, uh, then they will think of uh, coming back uh, to work. Now, Rastas, finally, tell us a bit about this company and the role that it plays. So, uh, virtually, this is an uh, oil processing company. They process palm uh, uh, nut uh, into a base product uh, for you know, chocolate and for soap making and oils for the uh, market as well. So they have clients all over uh, Africa, Togo and beyond. And they have been a market player for the past uh, 40 years. Erastus Asari Donko, thank you very much. My colleague with Love Firm, Erastus Asari Donko, there bringing us those updates. Now, several thousands of birds were destroyed nationwide in the recent bird flu outbreak. Farmers across the country have been counting their losses since then, even as government promised it was working on a compensation package for affected farmers. But this afternoon, Minister for Food and Agriculture, Dr. Usu Efriye Akuto, has given the clearest indication yet that government will not renege on that promise. According to him, he has currently put before cabinet a memo to see to compensation for all the affected farmers. He's been speaking in the Western region. My colleague, Kweku Asante, is following him on his tour and joins us with some details. Uh, Kweku, the minister paid a curtsy call on the paramount chief of Sefiruoso. What were the key issues he raised and how has the minister been responding? All right, Mama V. So, at this meeting with the paramount chief of Sefiruoso, issues about the bed, the bed flu came up and the decision by government to compensate the specific farmers who were affected 
by the flu a few months ago. According to the minister, the memo that has been presented to cabinet is still being worked on, and by the end of this month or close to the end of next November this year, final decision will be taken on the memo, and then farmers will be adequately compensated. But there's also been issues about cocoa trees in the region. We know that Western and Western North region is one of the biggest regions in terms of cocoa production. The minister has been talking about the swelling shoot disease, and they are decision to cut down some trees and also compensate farmers. The chief has been saying that they, the, the owners, the custodians of the land, have not been adequately compensated. And so he wants the minister to take some actions on it. The minister has promised that when he gets back to Accra, this is a decision he will look into together with the team. Mm. And Kweku, did the, did the Paramount chief talk about how widely they've been affected by the bird flu virus? We know that when the bird flu virus came about, the Western North region and the Western region were spread to some extent. But in August, there were some isolated cases in the region. But now we know that it seems to be a bit widespread, although they did not put specific numbers to it. We are told that a lot of farmers have suffered some devastating consequences as a result of this. And they are hoping that government would take some concrete steps to ensure that this does not only happen again in the future, but the kind of losses that they've made now is something that it can be compensated for. And so although they did not put a specific number to it, it is understood that it is wide in the region of the And Kweku, yesterday you reported from the Western North. Today you are in the Western region. What is the next destination? Right. So the minister's convoy is currently heading towards the Ahamsa district where he's inspecting some farms. We'll also be looking at some factories that have been created, another one district, one factory in the region as well. And so the minister will today be in the Western region before heading to the Central region tomorrow. We'll leave it here, Kweku Asante, my colleague, following the Agric minister on his tour. He's currently in the Western region. Now, former Medina MP Boniface Abubakar Sadiq has charged leadership of the governing NPP to reprimand or sanction persons in breach of the Code of Conduct guiding the upcoming internal elections. The party has asked aspiring candidates at all levels and their supporters to refrain from any form of campaign activities until nominations are opened. But that has been violated as supporters of some aspirants are seen openly endorsing their preferred candidates at the ongoing regional delegates conference. Flag bearer hopeful Bwachi Jako had caused to lodge a complaint against constituency chairman of Chirapone, Suleimana Aliu, after he endorsed the vice president for 2024. The former MP says Bwachi Jako's anger is justified. He spoke to my colleague, Kwesi Parker Wilson. The national executives, I think when it started earlier, the national executives were called to order. Please call the people to order for them to operate within the confines of the party's constitution. Anybody who goes beyond the, the, the constitution infringes on the rights of others. That will not be acceptable. I think they've drawn the lines. But some people in their hard way think that they must do it. But I think it's totally wrong. We should come back to our senses. This is what will help the party. We should not encourage indiscipline. That will not help at all. But at least, uh, in every, uh, let's say, in every action, or in every institution or a principle that is installed, you have exceptions. But the exceptions should not go beyond a certain limit. So I think, at the end of the day, anybody who infringes the set down laws will be called either reprimanded or cautioned. I think it's better. I see, but you said, you said that Bwacha Yaku raised some concerns. Yeah, yesterday he did. Because anybody who saw it was, would say that no, even whoever was being declared there will not be happy that his name has been mentioned in the play. And I think Bwacha Yaku is a presidential hopeful. Right. A flag bearer hopeful in the presidential hopeful. So for me, I'm an observer, and I know my role. But was this agitation legitimate? Very legitimate. I mean, but national, national executives are there. They Madera, are in control. This is a flag bearer hopeful. Right. And he's seen something wrong. He shouldn't complain to the national executives. He knows the constitution. This was, this was the campaign manager for the current president. Mm. 
So he knew the rules. He knows the constitution. And he sees that the constitution is being flopped. Will he keep quiet? So for me, because I'm not a presidential hopeful, have you seen me complain? But you also have a I candidate. I was smiling. You also have a candidate. My arm is, is in my pocket, but it is not time for me to speak. Mm. Me, I'm interested in ensuring that I see that this exercise is carried on and ended in a very fruitful and peaceful manner. We need unity. We need togetherness. And we need to love each other. Let's head to the Eastern region now, where President Kufuado is soliciting support from traditional authorities uh, to bring an end to the protracted chieftaincy dispute in the country before his tenure ends. Correspondent Maxwell Kudako joins us with more. Uh, Maxwell, bring us up to speed on the present activities in the region. Well, today is the second day of the president's three-day store in the Eastern region. Uh, today, he started with a call on the uh, Brihini who doubles as the Adon Tihini of the Equipim traditional area, the Otumbo Jankwesi. And uh, at the Otumbo, in front of the Otumbo Jankwesi's palace, the president made a passionate appeal to the Otumbo Jankwesi to ensure that the protracted uh, chieftaincy dispute surrounding the Equipim Hines to is resolved immediately. He was very happy that just three days ago, the chief tansy dispute at around the surrounding the Gar Manchester was resolved, ensuring the coronation, induction, and gazette of the Gar Manchester. He is of the opinion that if all the chiefs will rally behind him, he would ensure that all the chief tansy disputes in the country are resolved before the end of his tenure in 2024. The president also assured the people of Okapiman and his enclave that. He's going to do all possible, all, uh, everything possible within his powers to ensure that they get their fair share of development in the area. Presently, we are at the Kropon where the president is expected to commission one of the one district, one factory project here at the Kropon. It's a shoe factory that has been commissioned here or that's been established here to produce shoe for the local and the foreign market. So the president just arrived at the Kropon to commission the shoe fabrics here in a point in the Eastern region. Thank you very much, Maxwell Kudako, our Eastern Regional Correspondent with an update on the President Tour of the region. It is day two of three. Now, residents of Akode, a rural community near Edukrom in the Okre districts of the Eastern region say they are living in fear following increasing cases of crime in the area. They are blaming the situation on weak mobile network and internet connectivity. They say the police have been unsuccessful in foiling robbery cases, most uh, or especially because victims and residents are unable to solicit their assistance on time any time there are attacks. They want government to intervene in the provision of internet and expand mobile telecommunication network to help check crime and boost healthcare delivery. Edwin Kofisian has the rest of the story. The stretch between Edukrum and Akode has recorded a number of robbery cases, including the killing of an ambulance driver. The 44-year-old senior emergency technician, Abraham Tete, was shot by highway robbers while transporting a woman in labor from Somenia to Koforidia sometime in February this year. Some residents and robbery victims claim after the incident that all their efforts to contact the police to follow the attack proved futile due to poor mobile network connectivity. The absence of these essential services does not only affect the security of the people, but healthcare delivery in the district. Something is happening to you somewhere. You wouldn't get access to the internet or the network to call someone to help you. So by the time you realize whatever is supposed to happen to you has happened already. There is a bungalow attached to the school and teachers who are living here, we live in fear. When we heard that news, it, although it wasn't a new to us because it has been happening on this road. So most of the times we, 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 we live in fear and panic. Yes, and there is no network. So when even um, robbers come to attack you in the school, especially in the bungalow, when you shout, the school is not close to the community. You can't make a call because of network challenge. The internet connection here was very bad. Even trying to reach someone, 
placing a paw, trying to make a research becomes a problem. So you have to sometimes move all the way from here to either Somania or Edukrom to affect internet. A USAID statistics estimate that more than 4 billion people in developing countries, including Ghana, still do not have access to the internet. Women are, on the average, 14% less likely to own mobile phones than their male counterparts and 43% less likely to engage online. The rapid development and adoption of digital technology is transforming how people worldwide assess information, goods, and services. But in Akode, the story is different. Residents struggle to make calls and connect to the internet. Due to this, the Hangar Project has partnered Blue Town Telecommunications, USAID, and GIFEC to increase young women's economic opportunities by providing meaningful internet connectivity. Samuel Afrani is the country director for the Hangar Project. Even though this project is meant to bridge the gender gap in digital access, but it is also meant to bridge this digital access as far as urban and rural places are concerned because we know that internet connectivity in the rural areas lag behind that of the urban centers. Stephanie Ashley, project manager for the Women's Meaningful Access Project, explained that whilst residents access information, the provision of computers and internet will also boost the learning of ICT for students. And for this ICT center, we have available micro-operators who will be training the community partners in internet usage and also advocating for people to bring their children just to be computer literate. The University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG, is meeting with governments over threats to embark on a strike. The meeting follows what UTAG says is government's failure to reach an agreement with them over the remuneration for lecturers at the entry level. Last month, UTAG was in a mandatory 30-day negotiation over its demand for $2,084 for entry-level lecturers. But the association had indicated that despite backing down on some of their demands, and government pledging its commitment, nothing tangible has been achieved yet. Here are except of a memo cited by Joy News that they sent to their members indicating the threat of a strike. And it reads, following the signing of the memorandum of agreements with the employer to complete the negotiations on the conditions of service of university teachers within one month by resolving all outstanding issues, which form the basis for suspending the strike action it is sad to report that the one-month moratorium has elapsed and the negotiation has almost reached a stalemate. Unfortunately, within the one-month moratorium, the employer never shifted its position, even though UTAC made a number of concessions. For this reason, the National Executive Committee of UTAC at its meeting held on 1st October resolved that if the employer's position remains unchanged, by Friday 8th of October 2021, members should resume the suspension of teaching and related activities until further notice. And it says all members are hereby directed to observe this directive and act accordingly. Jointly signed by Professor Solomon Nunu, National President, and Dr. Asari Asante Ano, or Ano, National Secretary of UTAC. Well, in an interview with my colleague Benjamin Akako on News Desk, National President of UTAC, Professor Solomon Nunu, said the association may revise its stance depending on the outcome of a meeting it is having with government today. We'll bring you more from that meeting in subsequent bulletins. This is Joy News Today. We've got business coming up. Please stay with us.
Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Trade and Industry Minister Alan Chiamantia says implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement cannot be optimized without the significant involvement of engineering professionals. To this end, the country's action plan for AFTA is to align it with industrial strategy. According to Mr. Chiamatin, uh, strategic entry points must be created for engineers in order to fully harness the free trade project. There is more in the following report. Speaking at the opening of the Faith Africa Engineering Conference here in Accra, Mr. Chiamantin said over 86% of the rules of the origin have been agreed and 44 member states of the African Union have already submitted their Tariff Office for Tariff Liberalization. Thus, he called for the mobilization and deployment of engineering professionals across the continent to support production of infrastructure and facilities to fully benefit from AFTA. For any country to harness the benefits of AFTA, they have to be able to produce goods which can be traded or sold to other African countries. Without the production of goods or without value addition, there can be no AFCFTA. I believe this calls for the mobilization and deployment of engineering professionals around the continent with the capacity and capabilities to support production in various strategic sectors in which African countries have a comparative advantage. The president of the Federation of African Engineering Organizations, Engineer Kalin Bouchadid, said Africa cannot develop without engineering and therefore engineers must position themselves to be the organization that drives a sustainable socioeconomic development. Engineering will obviously play a critical role in the implementation of AFTA and FILE is uniquely positioned to deliver on what is required to ensure its success. So FILE has already started taking some actions. We signed the Africa-Asia Pacific Accord and this is aimed at harmonizing standards in engineering education and practice. We've proposed a, product, a project to produce a compendium of design loads and codes that will lead to the harmonization of standards in engineering goods and services. And we intend to begin with the building codes. We'd like to see harmonized codes across Africa. After it's an ambitious program which provides for 90% of all tariff lines to be fully liberalized by all state parties. Now, Access Bank has unveiled its business protection insurance offering to provide protection against fire, flood, burglary, and personal accidents for small and medium scale enterprises. The business protection insurance is the newest addition to the portfolio of insurance offered by the bank in partnership with Coronation Insurance. Unveiling the new insurance package at an SME forum at the National Theatre in Accra, Head of Sales and Distribution at Coronation Insurance, Seth Soga, encouraged business owners to take advantage of the offer to secure their businesses. Richard Kojonyako has more. Head of Retail Banking, Matilda Santiesiedu, assistant the managing director of Access Bank, to unveil the bank's newest product that seeks to offer protection to businesses. President of the Traders Advocacy Group Ghana, David Amuate commended Access Bank for their ever-growing interest in meeting the needs of traders and businesses in general and for partnering TAG. He challenged Coronation Insurance to move out of their comfort zones into the market spaces to educate business owners on insurance. Because somebody spoke today, but here our mothers, they don't know. A lot of them don't know the benefit of insuring their product. Why do you think somebody will take about 150000 to rent a shop? Forget about the staff that are in the shop. And that person, if you appoint the person and educate the person and tell the person, maybe a year you will pay 2000 Do you think that woman will not pay? That woman will definitely pay because the person doesn't know. And whose responsibility it is to teach that woman? It is the responsibility of the insurance companies. Mr. Martin called on Access Bank to continue to support businesses with soft loans, especially as the U tide approaches to strengthen small scale businesses. Hello. Hi. So, we're 
Group head, Retail Banking of Access Bank, Matilda Santiesi, who called on SMEs to secure their businesses with the business protection insurance to avert the unfortunate situation that befall many in times of flood, fire, burglary, and personal accidents. Additionally, she encouraged traders not to defer in taking insurance policies, but to act on information they have received at the forum. Reporting for Joy Business, Richard Kwejonyakon. All right, you're watching Join News today. Let's take you live to Parliament where the Church of Pentecost and others are presenting a petition to members of the House in support of the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill. All Christians and other religious bodies in this nation. So all we say is what we've been saying as Ghanaians, that God bless our homeland, Ghana, and make our nation great and strong. Thank you. I'll call on Gako women. On behalf of on behalf of Gako Women's Ministry, we are standing in for all women in this country. And we thank God for this privilege to present this on all women in all parts of this nation. So represent us. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call on National Clergy Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, I have the mandate of the General Secretary of that association, even though I'm not an active member, because he's a medical person, he had an emergency, he asked me to stand in. I'm also here on behalf of the National Association of Charismatic and Christian Churches. Uh, let me say that um, we have already submitted soft versions of what we have, but we thought that uh, it's proper for us to also come with our brethren to submit our hard copies of this. We stand by this memo, by this uh, bill and the objectives, objects thereof, um, for many reasons. But one outstanding reason is that we see it as a way of um, also opening the boundaries of the freedom of speech, especially when the gospel, where the gospel is concerned. Because we have seen in many countries where this kind of uh, liberty is going on, that they, on the other side, the gospel or preachers have been gacked from telling what they believe to be true about people's sexuality or otherwise. The teachers have been gacked, and the society has been gacked. And we do not want to sit here for one day, preachers to get to the point where they cannot speak the truth that they know from the gospel. And for this reason, on behalf of the National Clergy Association of Ghana and also the National Association of Charismatic Christian Churches, we also submit our memos. Thank you. Honorable Sir, I will now call on the chairman of the Church of Pentecost and Affiliates. Thank you, Chairman and Honorable uh, Mr. Eric Osumesa, Deputy Acting Deputy Clerk of Parliament. Um, speaking on behalf of the Church of Pentecost. The Church of Pentecost is 10.38% of the Ghanaian population. And we are, we are against this LGBTQ blasting. And the blast is never going to end. Our concern is not about today, it's about the future. 
today when we elect in this LGBTQ plus, what is going to happen is that we are going to accept same-sex marriage, which the president says that it is never going to happen at his watch. But if he allows LGBT plus to start, it is true that it is never going to happen at his watch. By the time we get into same-sex marriage, the president will not be the president of the nation. I agree with him, but he should stop this. He should close the door at where it matters. And we are saying that he should close it now. This movement is an insult to the intelligence of God, the Creator. We are just trying to tell God that you didn't think enough. This is how it should have been. And if you have a society where there are no absolutes, soon there will be no law. And we have to be very careful. And our lawyers who are arguing for all this, the matter on the floor is not about rights, it's about morality. So the Church of Pentecost, with a population of 3,196,605, are supporting this bill that is before the floor of Parliament. We want to encourage our parliamentarians to argue and argue well. And they know that they are creations of God. They didn't come out of apes. That's right. And so they shouldn't use science as the base. That's right. They should know that the one who made this creation has the right to determine as to how the creation should behave. And the other creatures should not tell us how other creations should behave. Now, we have written six memos with 15,000 signatures. <laughs> Our trustees have signed, all pastors and wives in this church have signed, even our students have signed. And so we want to present memos, the six memos coming from our women, our men, the youth in the Church of Pentecost, the children in the Church of Pentecost, all workers in the Church of Pentecost, and of course our theologians. And so in all humility, we want to do our presentation and this is the signature. is more or less like the Act of the Covenant, <laughs> which has been brought to Parliament this morning. And uh, we believe that with the Act in, the, in Parliament, we have won the race. And, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we want to thank you very much. These are the groups here uh, represented, and we have done our presentation. And uh, we we'll say a very big thank you for once again the warm reception. Thank you. Yeah, please let me add that our regional representatives will also send this, and I think the the soft copies will come, and then the hard copies will come because they know the deadline to be tomorrow, and so. Who would not miss the deadline? Who we'll make sure that they are done? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Most Reverend, and uh, your ministers. We are happy that you've taken interest in the work of Parliament, and that is what we expect you and other citizens of the country to do. Because the laws are made here, but they are made for the citizens of the country. So it is the interest of Parliament that the citizens also participate in the lawmaking process. 
and this is uh, one bill that has generated a lot of interest. The Catholic Bishop Conference, as you said, have, they have presented their um, memo already. Assemblies of God has also presented. Islamic Council has also presented. And then you have also come in. I'm informed by the clerk to the committee that she has received more than 100 memos from all over the world, which means that the bill is very, very important and people have interest in it. We are most grateful that you are here. The bill was laid in Parliament. As you know, it was um, Honorable Sam George, who and seven others who presented the bill. It was referred to the Committee on Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs. As you said, after the deadline, the committee will meet and examine the bill alongside all the memoranda received. At any point at a committee level, you can be involved. Even if you want to make presentations before the committee, you'll be permitted. You'll be permitted to do that. So the door is not closed yet. You still have another opportunity to meet with the committee at a stakeholders conference to be held later, but the date will come out. So on behalf of the clerk to parliament, I wish to thank you most sincerely for coming and to present this, to make these presentations. That once the clerk is here, the committee will obviously lay hands on the memos and at the appropriate time, if we have to invite you, we will invite you to come and then contribute towards shaping the bill before passage. Hello, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the sports segment uh, with me, Oreiko Wampofo. And let's do some boxing where former IBF champion Richard Comey's request to reclaim in world title glory is set to hit a high point as he faces fellow former champion Vasil uh, Lomachenko of Ukraine. The fight likely to come on uh, in the first week of December this year also has implications not only for Comey but the entire light, lightweight division. The Ghanaian has a record of 33 wins and 3 losses. Also Richard Comey versus Lomachenko. That's about that we're all looking forward to. But that wraps up for the sports time. Uh, Thank you, Oreko. And that's it for joining us today. Do log on to myjoline.com for more news. Bye for now.